And the next talk is by uh, BKO um, about uh, machine-assisted calibration. So, uh, the microphone, Ro Roberta. <laughs> That could, have, that could have been embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm BK. Uh, I'm a postdoc at the University of Connecticut. And I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this chance to talk about my work, uh, which I've done with my collaborators uh, from SNU, so National University. And it's using uh, machine learning algorithms to help us uh, explore and calibrate the simulation parameters. And so this, this technique, this tool that we have developed is now being used uh, to generate a data set for the CAMELS uh, collaboration that Romeo was talking about. So, right, first things first, uh, we know simulation is a tool that helps us study the evolution, uh, galaxy formation. So we have um, different length scales that we are interested in, and if you want to simulate the entire thing, there's 15 orders of magnitude difference, which is uh, impossible for our current simulations to cover this entire range. So we have some subgrid models below the resolution limits to help us uh, do all this uh, star formation and uh, black hole physics. But we do get like nice pictures and nice uh, tools, nice uh, results that we can analyze for different components. So this is taken from the TNG website and you see you can understand the dark matter density to anything about the gas, stars, magnetic field and even X-ray luminosity. So. Uh, simulation is a tool that is uh, important for us in advancing our understanding. However, there's this back end of the simulation that we need to calibrate it to match observations. So, uh, you know, um, like for TNG in this paper here, they have to done uh, they have to do like simulations of different parameters uh, where they try to match the cosmic star formation rate. Um, then on the right here is the calibration that's done by Flamingo, one of the recent simulations on the uh, stellar mass functions. So this is an uh, important step in simulations uh, that has to take place in order for us to have predictive power using the uh, simulation. So uh, it is not a trivial task, so we have to invest a significant amount of computational resources into this calibration. So on, on the screen here is a work that I've done previously using a zoom simulation of a Milky Way sized galaxy. Uh, and the plot here, the FS and the FD is basically uh, observations that I will talk about later. And you know, when I do the manual calibration, you have to do one parameter at a time and see how it varies and try to get it in, term, uh, in range of the uh, targeted properties. So this is a very coarse simulation, so two kiloparsec and the dark matter mass is around 10 to the 7. Uh, with the turn and all striker model that's available in Enzo, uh, you know, each simulation takes about a day to reach redshift zero, and using a total of 71 simulations, which, equiv which is equivalent to 71, 71 days, uh, that's the amount of time I took to, to match the observations at redshift zero. So this is a significant part of the simulation. So for more details, uh, in the model itself, I've only calibrated three particular parameters. So the star formation efficiency, which is the uh, conversion of gas into stars, the strength of the feedback, and the volume in which the feedback is being injected into. So in, in this model itself, there's a degree of freedom where you can choose how the feedback is being injected into the grid. So talking about the observation, so we, we took the observation from McGaw. Uh, so Basically, what we are trying to do is we are trying to match the uh, gas and the stellar mass in the halo at redshift zero. So we, we took these uh, properties, the FD and the F star that I was talking about earlier. Uh, basically, it's, it's a fraction of the baryon mass to the uh, 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 universal baryon fraction multiplied by the M500. And then similarly for the F star, that's just the, the stellar mass component. So we are 
calibrating uh, these two uh, observations with the three parameters that's uh, given in the Sun and striker model. So on top of um, calibrating the simulations to observations, one of the things that we do is also the co code comparison, which is the spirit of the Agora project. So in this uh, this plot here is is done by Shin et al. in 2021. Uh, so what the paper was trying to do is to look at the discrepancy between the grid base and particle base code. So uh, here it's about how the metals are being distributed in the halo itself. And if you were to look at uh, the bottom two rows, you see that, you know, so the, the leftmost is the Enzo runs, the, the middle and the right, it's with um, different combination of parameters in gizmo codes. So um, you see that the, how the metal is being diffused. So this color bar is the projected metal density, and as well as the velocity, uh, you see that it's, it is completely different. So what we are trying, what this, what I'm trying to do is also to apply this machine to a different kind of problem. So it's it's trying to show how versatile this machine can be. So as as the input for the machine, it's the diffusivity and the feedback energy, and the output is the halo metal mass and the gas mass within a certain metallicity. So the the structure of uh, the machine itself, it's so. We are trying to employ active learning, so it's an interaction between the data generation and machine. So essentially what we do is we give the machine a training set of data, so we run a few simulations, we give it to the machine, the machine would, uh, based on what observables you want to minimize uh, the difference between observation and simulator properties, the machine would recommend a set of parameters that you can use. So you run the simulations and you look at the output from the simulation, you analyze the properties and you feed it back to the machine itself. So the machine would, uh, using this active learning, the machine will focus more and more on the region of interest within uh, the simulation parameters. So what we are using is using a neural density estimator. So uh, it, it gives a, a distribution of the, out, uh, the recommendation with uh, mixtures of uh, Gaussian. So there's a range of Gaussians that it's going to give, and uh, what the machine takes is the probability and the mean and the standard deviation. And from there, it gives, uh, by minimizing this loss function, uh, we are trying to get the, the recommendation for us to run the next test. So in order to use the machine, we have to first calibrate the hyperparameters. So uh, we, we started off with a very simple problem. So we just wanted to get a sense of what kind of parameters we should use. And the aim of this hyperparameter calibration is to mimic a, for example, a graduate student just starting or he's, he or she is intending to calibrate a simulation set. And uh, so there's limited amount of computational resources available. So we use this uh, simple projectile motion. So the aim yeah, is to mimic the dimensionality, so three inputs and the, three out, uh, the two outputs in order for us to calibrate the hyperparameters. So the hyperparameters that we, ca uh, we are testing is the number of initial data, uh, number of Gaussians used in the machine, and the number of recommendations, that, uh, sorry, the number of additional runs the, the machine needs. So based on our tests, you see that um, we, li we limit the number of in initial throws for training. Of course, if you were to give 1,000 throws to the machine, maybe the machine can perform very well. But in terms of simulation, that's not available. So we are limiting the number of initial data set the machine needs. So we, we found that five is minimizing the, the number of ad, uh, total throws, as well as the number of Gaussians and the number of additional throws per iteration. So this is uh, analog to the number of additional simulations that we need per iteration. So it's only limited to one and two because, yeah, simulations are expensive. So what we find is using the... Uh, the same run that I've done before of the zoom simulation, uh, the green and the blue line is basically the, uh, the limit that we found with manual calibration. We can use the machine to find a optimal by 22 simulation. So if you remember, the manual calibration took 71. So this is a factor of three saving in computational resources. And in fact, it gives better agreement. You see that the, if you compare it to the blue line, it's, it's well below the agreement that's found by the manual calibration. But if we look at the 
input parameter space. So this on the left here is the output parameter space, which is how well it matches the observation. If you look at the input parameter space, after it found the best match to the observation, there's a huge variation in the parameters. So the machine doesn't continuously provide recommendation uh, for good match to observation. And so we wanted to try a strategy where the machine can find an optimal and it's going to focus, zoom in on this optimal to find potentially a better match. So we did this uh, exploration plus exploit. So the exploit method is basically uh, when we take the difference of uh, between the first and the second most probable Gaussian to be more than 0 0.2, the machine will just focus on the first, uh, the most probable Gaussian. So you see that we minimize the variation in the input parameters and we do get an improvement in the uh, in the agreement. So there's a decrease. So it's it's focusing on this region, and it's it's giving us a better agreement. So yeah, like I was saying, we found optimal by 32 simulations, and in another 14 simulations, we found another match. So this is a, a factor of two in saving. So it's still less than what manual calibration is doing. Then, as I was saying, we did the code comparison for the uh, metal diffusion between uh, grid base and mesh, uh, grid base and particle base codes. So, uh, on the left is the observa uh, not observable, but the uh, simulated properties, the difference in the simulated properties, and on the right is the input to the machine. So you see here, there's this oscillatory behavior that's given by the machine. And we tried to, I mean, if, if you were a human user, you would see that this is just an observation, uh, I mean, just an oscillation. So you would put in, using human intervention, something in the middle, and that's what we did. And as soon as we put in that human intervention, you see that the, the machine starts performing uh, according to what we want. Uh, so, yeah, but the thing is, uh, we, we found the optimal by 14 simulations, and from this uh, machine recommended properties, its uh, parameters, it's very similar to what uh, manual calibration did. But we want it to be more deterministic because uh, who, when and where you put in the human intervention or not, it's random. So we want it to be uh, more systematic. And so we tried changing the hyperparameters. As I was saying, the hyperparameters was just uh, calibrated using a toy model. So it's not uh, not fully justified, so there's room to wiggle around for the hyperparameters, and like we find that changing the number of Gaussians to 100 actually get rid of, gets rid of the uh, oscillatory behavior that's being exhibited by the code. So as I was saying, we were doing this. Uh, I'm going to apply this to the uh, Camel simulation uh, data set. So in the Camel simulation, there's thousands of simulation within each uh, code. So that's the TNG, Simba, Astrid, and Magneticum. So the aim is to introduce Enzo as a new data set. So you see here is the, the blue, as the title was showing, the dark matter density, and then the, uh, the red is the, uh, the temperature. So yes, that's the, the main, the, one of the aims of the Camo uh, data set uh, collaboration is to provide this huge amount of data for machine learning purposes. So they are used, they, they need a variety, a huge variety of uh, simulation code to increase the robustness of the machine learning algorithm that they are training. So uh, at the moment, there's uh, TNG, Simba, Astrid, and Magneticum, and uh, they are varying six parameters, two cosmological and four astrophysical. And so what we want, as I was saying, what I wanted to do is to create this new data set with Enzo, and we are just using the turn and off striker model again, and, but now we are increasing the degrees of freedom, so we have more parameters that we are allowing it to vary, and we are trying to match the star formation rate density at four different rate shifts. Right, so this is the, the calibration that is ongoing, so we have I've done 20 simulations already with the machine learning algorithm. So yeah, you have the initial data set and you ask the machine to recommend and they are color coded. So but you see the how the star formation rate density is uh, evolving. There's three main categories uh, that, that you can see. So one is it's increasing uh, 
to reach its zero, but it's not quenching at later rate shifts. So that's one category. The next category is the feedback suppresses the star formation rate early, but then it picks up at later time. And then the last category is there's a similar trend to what we are trying to match, which is from Simba. And there's a similar trend, but it's suppressed across uh, different rate shifts, uh, across all rate shifts. So one possible way is, so you see that this is like on the late, in the later run, so this is a new trend that's being uh, discovered by the machine, basically. So mm, perhaps running more runs, we will be able to shift this up further. Um, otherwise, we would have to in include AGN feedback in our own simulations. So um, in summary, um, there's this new technique that we found, that we've developed for different purposes in simulation. Uh, it helps us identify the discrepancy in the parameters and maybe the limitations in the implemented model. So as we see in when I'm trying to calibrate it for the CAMELS collaboration. And it provides a region of parameter space to focus on. So once we have this region of parameter space, perhaps manual calibration can take over. Uh, but one thing is for sure that this, this tool provided a huge saving in computational resources in the problems that we've explored so far. Right. That's the end. Thank you. An important tool. Uh, we have time for questions, so one question there. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm surprised that you need 100 Gaussians in your mixture density network model. So this means that the posterior distributions you're trying to estimate are extremely multimodal. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and did you check these distributions? Do you need really 100 Gaussians? Because uh, you know, I've never seen that. I, I think we checked with a different number of Gaussians, but we still got that fluctuation. So it's only after 100 that we managed to get rid of the oscillation that we found. So. My understanding is that the more Gaussians you have, the more peaks you have, so the more fluctuations you should have, right? Mm -hmm. Because the more Gaussians you have, is your, you need Gaussians to describe the peaks in the posterior distribution, right. which are yes. multimodal. Mm -hmm. 100 peaks mix, uh, means you know, uh, extremely multimodal distribution, so I would have expected more fluctuations instead no, of but less. The, but the 100 Gaussians that you're using is to describe the posterior, right? So right. You're not, but, you know, it, the posterior might not be multi-peak. It then might be one peak, but you are focusing if you have 100 Gaussians, you are focusing on that, uh, the, the, the main peak in the distribution. Right, but if you need 100 Gaussian, it means that, well, we can discuss later, yeah, but if sure. you have 100 Gaussian, for me, it means that the, the posterior is extremely complex. Okay, right. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. Um, so I have a kind of hypothetical question. So um, if you, apply your methodology to two, uh, two kinds of different simulations with different implementations of physics. And if you can tune them to reproduce the observations that you can find to the same degree, but they, have, they should have different like, implementations. So likely the, uh, the parameters that, uh, uh, parameter values that are controlling their different physics implementations are going to be different. Then, but they're reproducing the same data, then what would your interpretation be? So wouldn't that be just the difference in the subgrid model that you're implementing in the simulations? That's right. So, yeah. so, so I guess, so with very different subgrid physics, we are reproducing the same data, then sure. how, how can we tell which one implementation is better or like makes more sense? What? Uh, I guess it's a multi-dimensional thing. Like so if, if one um, subgrid model works best for one simulation code, then that same model might not work as well in, in other implementations. So, yeah. OK, we have time for a very fast last question. Interesting talk. So you know, in generating these large numbers of simulations, unless you're running codes that are are very fast, you, you have to cut corners usually in terms of resolution. You have to run lower resolution simulations. So are, are you certain that then by calibrating to low resolution simulations that a converged simulation might give you a different answer for the same input parameters and you might actually be 
biasing the results of your, you know, how you guide the uh, the, save, the cost savings that you're trying to generate? Uh, you know, do you have any comment on how resolution affects? Yeah, I think yes. I think resolution effect is uh, is definitely an issue, and like even just across resolution, people have implemented uh, machine learning just just so that they can transfer the physics from low resolution to high resolution. High resolution. So that is certainly something that um, if you want to transfer this, then yeah, that that has to be taken into account on top of the calibration. Yeah. Okay. So what is it here? We thank again BK for the nice talk. Thank you.